It isn't often that a Zombies map releases which captures the essence of exactly what the developers had intended. And when that blend of near-perfect artistry, gameplay, and narrative all hit the right notes, a synergy is created that elevates the Zombies experience to what can only be described as an iconic status. When looking back at Black Ops 4, it's clear that DLC 2 was the pinnacle moment for the game, as what came before and after its debut all but shattered the community into a million little pieces. And while hindsight is 2020, it doesn't always prove to be the full truth, as those same goggles that we use to view the past can also become hazy with our nostalgia. Ancient Evil sits in a very special place in time, as it not only served as the showpiece for Black Ops 4, but it revealed to fans what could have been if things had only worked out differently. But unfortunately, it was just too late. If we free the Oracle, and free my father. I hope you know what you're doing, Scarlet. January 15th is a day just like any other for most people, but for you watching this video and myself, well, we know it to be something a little more special, 115 Day. A day that lives infamously in the hearts of many Zombies fans around the globe, as it represents the sole purpose of our mode's narrative existence, Element 115. Over the years, Treyarch has generally tried to do something cheeky or special to excite the Zombies community. It's never anything huge, but things like triple double XP, discounts on consumables in the shop, and perhaps a blog post touching base with the community. It's all pretty par for the course. However, on 115 Day during Black Ops 4's life cycle, we received a short video from Jason Blundell going over a handful of tweets that fans had sent in. And while most were not anything too exciting, there was one question and response from Jason that did grab the attention of the player base. It says, uh, can you tease what's going to be in DLC 2? Uh, what a very good and direct question. I don't know if I can say that on these kind of Twitters and YouTube uh, social media thing. It's uh it's all Greek to me. That one little line of it's all Greek to me was all that was needed to officially confirm where our next Zombies map was taking place. And while more dedicated fans were able to infer this from the ending cutscene on Voyage of Despair, no one was ever truly certain if Delphi would be a location our characters would explore in this alleged first season of Zombies content. What was curious about learning this small bit of information was that we were only in the middle of January, which meant that DLC 2 wasn't going to be coming anytime soon. And while of course we had five maps to play inside of Black Ops 4, people were already clamoring for the next DLC, as fans were beginning to accept the Chaos storyline and become interested in this new cruise adventures, a sentiment which I will come back to in just a bit. Operation Grand Heist launched on February 19th, 2019, but unfortunately, the wait for DLC 2 would continue and the drip feeding of smaller bits of content would have to suffice. A new gauntlet on Classified, a new perk, Ethereal Razor, and some new weapons obviously help to satiate players' appetites, but nothing satisfies that craving like a new Zombies map for players to sink their teeth into, which wasn't coming in until sometime in late March. We weren't even sure at this point. However, we learned quite a bit of information about Treyarch's plans regarding their DLC model, as it appeared that we were going to be receiving our content in some sort of seasonal delivery method. This implied that the next map would be capping things off for the Chaos storyline temporarily, while we would then return to Aether to finish Primus and Ultimus's tragic tale. This map represents the last map of the Chaos story for this season. Mm -hmm. For this season. Mm -hmm. Jason, this is... where are you going with this? <laughs> So this, what could it mean? So this is this is the, this is the cliffhanger no, here. Maybe a step too far, but it's cool. Let's just <laughs> he, can, he can go higher in pitch if he tries. So this is I'm the, the wrong pads. <laughs> this is this is the last one of the chaos story for this season. For this season. This season. For this season. This season. For this season. So the next two, so going to our DLC three and DLC four, will be back to the ether storyline. Fans started clamoring that this must mean we would be receiving even more zombies content after the life cycle of the game, meaning that there would be more maps, modes, and content variety than any other zombie. Zombies games before it. And while the wait for the next chapter in the Ether story was grueling, this trade of player patience for a year or two of content was something I think most fans were okay with making. Now, a few moments ago, I mentioned there was a bit of a shift occurring inside of the community regarding the acceptance of Black Ops 4 Zombies. It wasn't that the majority of people were ecstatic about Ether being pushed back so late into the DLC cycle, but most players knew that there wasn't anything that they could do about it, and so as the dust began to settle from the initial tonal whiplash from the launch of BO4, so did the players' vitriol all begin to wither. Jason Blundell knew at the beginning of the game's life cycle that there would be a dissonance and severe pushback from the fan base, and stated publicly that he would remain calm and not resort to any radical decision making due to fan outcry in the early phases of the game. The thing I would say is so much stuff has changed. 
that I'm not going to be listening for a little bit. Ooh. I'm going to let everyone settle down, get to know it. Now, the problem with Jason's statement here is that it seems like his entire philosophy rested on the presupposition that the community was only going to be upset about the gameplay changes. And this was only partly true as they made one crucial error with their calculation. The devs simply didn't consider how the introduction of chaos and sidelining of the Ether crew would affect the player base, especially when the story was at its most pivotal moments. And so while Jason and Craig were telling fans in early 2019 that we were going to be experiencing a seasonal model of content, that mythical year two of zombies that we have always wanted, the truth was that Activision was nervous at how zombies was faring and would likely abandon ship the first chance they could which is exactly what happened. You see, when you combine this overwhelming sense of negativity from the fans with Activision's first major investment into zombies, at least at this scale anyways, it would make sense that any company would want to pivot to fix the mistakes that lay at their feet. And with the crazy mixed reception towards each zombies map that we had received inside of Black Ops 4, it makes sense that Activision would assume fans would likely reject Ancient Evil just as well. The only problem was, they were completely wrong. Not something that interests me. I am literally as pleased as punch. Where are you going, Kamayu? This looks like a bad idea. So what was it exactly about Ancient Evil that was so appealing to the fanbase? Was it the map's narrative, the world building and art design, or maybe it was the Easter egg? Well, funnily enough, it was a bit of everything as finally, after months of waiting, the Chaos storyline started to gain some momentum. Even though Dead of the Night was the final nail in the coffin for Black Ops 4, the map still brought a lot of value in terms of the storyline, as well as the substantial backstory explaining what the Order was up to through the High Priest of Chaos cutscene and the Dead of the Night music video. And when you combine that information with what was presented to fans inside of Voyage of Despair and Nine, we were finally all caught up and ready for the weaving of all major narrative threads to come together, setting us up for the next crucial piece of exposition. At this point, Treyarch was going out of their way to deliver ample story information that could have simply been told inside of a radio, cipher, or comic, so it was clear that Ancient Evil was gearing up to be something spectacular, as even the devs were giddy during their live stream presentations. After our four main characters were decapitated at the end of Nine, it turned out to all just be a hallucination as their untimely demise returned them back to the same cave where they again hear a familiar voice, the same one that instructed them to inhale those vapors. As our crew begins to gather their composure, Scarlet stands up and makes her way over to the archway where the voice then asks them, Did you find what you were looking for? Scarlet enters in a secret passcode that was acquired right before the Order murdered them, which allows them to open a secret gate into the hidden city of Delphi. Both bewildered and puzzled, Bruno, Diego, Scarlet, and Shaw make their way to the edge of an overlook where they see a beautiful view of a once bustling city, only to find that it has been completely left in disarray as a sentinel trial has been active for quite some time. The voice continues to call them as they tiptoe through the hordes of zombies being held back by the strength of our new ally who is being held captive inside of this trial. Trial, the Oracle. Finally, this mysterious voice has revealed herself and we can see that she is bound in shackles, begging for her freedom as she sits inside of a cloud of torturous noxious gases. The Oracle collapses of exhaustion and can no longer hold the zombies. And now we have to complete this trial that has been running for nearly 2,000 years. Quite an amazing setup and premise to build off of, but Treyarch doesn't stop there as things only get better when we look at the environmental storytelling. Without fail, every single one of the Chaos maps has been absolutely phenomenal in terms of its art design, world building, and set piece moments, and as you can see on your screen right now, Ancient Evil is no exception. Immediately upon spawning in the map, the player is standing in the Temple of Apollo with beautiful Greek art and statues surrounding them. High ceilings and infrastructure propped up by the iconic Greek columns as moody lighting fills the space from the flames glinting behind you. The oracle is still in her chair, hands and feet bound, which implies that her presence is a focal point where the player will eventually need to return. But before we do that, there is much we need to explore. Opening our first sets of doors exposes us to the grandiose city of Delphi, with again, more looming statues hovering over the player's heads, chaos crystals penetrating through the ground with dead bodies impaled at the tips of their sharp edges, a bridge leading us over a peaceful stream, and trees covering our 
our heads with the leaves gently falling to the ground. This all shows the stark contrast from section to section inside of the map, which also all connects beautifully as each piece of this ruined city tells a story all on its own. And as the player finally makes their way, either up the stairs or over the bridge, they will find themselves at an amphitheater with a sentinel artifact waiting to be engaged. Despite the trial running for centuries, the player must still interact with the artifact. And when they do, an ominous figure spawns in above us and says, Awaken my soldiers! Slay these of the Zombies begin pouring out of the stands surrounding the player who is locked in this now confined space when all of a sudden we are saved by an unsuspecting creature, Pegasus. Or is that Pegasus coming to the rescue? This is hands down one of the most badass set piece moments in Call of Duty Zombies history. Surviving an onslaught of zombies and being right at death's door to only be saved by one of the most iconic mythical animals in Greek mythology as he soars through the skies emitting lightning from his wings. Once the artifact has been activated again, the player can explore the rest of the locked off spaces which are brimming with so much personality and reverence for this ancient city of Greece. But as we continue our way down to the lower end of the map, we can hear the oracle calling us to gather Pegasus's gold golden bridle so that we can stop him from flying aimlessly in the sky and harness him. Once the player does this, another cutscene will play, but this time it's of us climbing on the back of our beloved winged horse and flying across the city of Delphi. And before the player can blink, Pegasus has taken us through a secret tunnel behind the waterfalls into a hidden section of the city where even more ruin has taken place. And while we are getting a good look at our surroundings, the enemy from before comes out of nowhere calling our attention angrily for helping the Pythia, throwing his sword at Pegasus and knocking the player off his back and onto the ground to begin exploring the most amazing artistic vision we have ever seen from Treyarch. Ancient Evil has been colloquially split into two sections called the Light and Dark Side, and while the Light Side is certainly stylized, the Dark Side really takes things to a new level. At the top of the steps, the player can get a wide view of everything that lays before them, and at the very back of the map you can see a woman with arrows in her and snakes coiling around her body as venom drips from her mouth. As we make our way down the steps, we can see that one of the paths leads us to a mouth and body of a large snake as the fangs from this reptile are thrusted in our face, making the player wonder if this perhaps isn't the safest way to go. But the sheer beauty of the map continues to unravel as we see the cavernous tunnels with cool bluish hues mixed with the harsh reds, the giant arrows that were shot by Apollo, all capped off by a green pool of venom that opens up to the center of the world. The other path of the dark side is also just as breathtaking, but Treyarch has taken more ancient Greek architecture and added a touch of destruction as this place beyond the falls is ripped apart at the seams. And while the sheer magnificence of the dark side can't quite be put into words, what really makes it special is how Treyarch took this artistic vision and made context clues for how the player can navigate through the map. This turns what would ordinarily be world building aesthetics into interactable tools the player can use for in-game progression. We see this first with the eagles locked in cages near the end of each path. The first indication these cages are important is that when we approach the first one on the ground, enemies will spawn in and attempt to protect it. The the second cage is held up by a chain and when shot down, another enemy comes out to stop us as well. These cages are also smeared in an orange material, indicating we need to interact with them using our specialist weapons. And once we do as such, the eagles are set free and head towards the Druze of Chaos in the center of the world. Once the player makes their way to this area, they will be locked in and forced to complete a holdout while an onslaught of zombies and other enemies attack them. The eagles begin to destroy the crystals with lightning and eventually reveal the Pack-a-Punch machine. The opening sequences of this map are so powerful. It's really difficult for each set piece moment to not leave an impression on you. As in the mere early rounds of this map, we have interacted with the Sentinel artifact to engage with Pegasus, ride on his back to discover the dark side, and had Zeus's eagles open up the Pack-a-Punch machine. Such an amazing introduction. And what makes it even better is that narratively, our foe has tried to stop us at every turn, implying something greater is bubbling beneath the surface. And while we don't know exactly what is happening at this point, the one thing we do know is the Oracle needs our help to stop this madman from succeeding with his plans inside of this map's main quest. 
In order to get things started, the player must activate the first step inside of this easter egg called Ignite the Beacons. This process occurs after the player tithes a small amount of points to the Oracle, where we will then be assigned a challenge to complete. These challenges can be from anything from killing zombies to holding out a specific area or using your specialist weapon as a main method of attack. After these challenges are completed, the player will then be given a reward that is ranked from common to epic. The longer you hold out on retrieving your reward, the higher you can push the rarity of your reward and receive things like pack-a-punched weapons, extra lives, and much, much more. The player will then have to complete this process twice and receive two epic statuses so that the fire pit in the spawn area can ignite. From there, we can take out our shield, also known as Apollo's Will, and place the tip of the spear in the flames where it will now enact as a temporary torch. We then need to find and place the flamed spear on three oil spills located around the map. These oil spills will catch fire and the flame will follow a small trail of oil up the wall, igniting various Greek symbols. Once all three have been lit up, the classic chaos chant will play, letting us know we have completed the step. But more importantly, we open a slot in the cave above us that lets a beam of light inside of Delphi. You see, as we progress through the main quest, we will be shifting these large mirror plates to reflect light in a certain direction into the dark side. So every step we complete will be revealing a hidden plate or shifting the light into the correct direction. Now, a big part of this map's main quest is getting set up, especially when it comes to ancient evils for wonder weapon variants. And we will get to those later in the video. But for this next step, we need to have the redeemed hand of Charon at our disposal. The player must make their way to the Spartan Monument section of the map and shoot a charge shot in the middle of the ground between these two sets of statues. And when the pool of blood from the charge shot lays out at our feet, we can step inside of it and our vision will turn black and white. While this is occurring, we will need to shoot the Spartan warrior statues whose eyes glow blue. Now for years, this step has always been puzzling. It never quite made sense why we had to do such a task as it always felt kind of random and out of place, but that really couldn't be further from the truth. Now it's no secret that Charon is the ferryman of the Greek underworld who collects coins from the dead so that their souls may pass the River of Styx, rather than wait 100 years wandering the shores before being able to pass the river. But what's more interesting is the etymology of the name Charon as it's often explained as a keen gaze and having fierce, flashing, or feverish eyes that are bluish gray in color. The flashing eyes may indicate the anger of Charon or even the eyes of a person close to death. And if you look at what happens to the statues when they are shot with the hand of Charon, they first have those glowing bluish gray eyes, and then they crumble while the souls of the Spartan warriors leave their bodies and turn into the special skeleton enemy types. And while it's not exactly clear why this is occurring, perhaps these warriors didn't pay the toll to cross the Styx River, and maybe this is their punishment. I suppose this is something we will never know. And while there is a level of uncertainty here, what is clear is that the influence from this mythos is present, which makes the step name looking the dead in the eye have much more meaning than what appears on a surface level. But now that this step has been completed, and the next mirror plate has revealed itself on the outskirts of Delphi's cliffside, we can move to the aligning of the citizens. And for this next step, we will need a fresh shield and a pack-a-punched weapon, as the player must locate three gears hidden behind brick walls of the city. We can find these gears by looking for cracks in the rubble with light piercing through and then shoot those weak points with our pack-a-punched gun. Once exposed, a small gear will travel to and fro, which needs to be stopped just above the stationary gear so that the two can conjoin and activate the pulley system it's attached to. We can do this by throwing Apollo's will at the gears just as they pass one another, and once the spears connect all the parts together, the gears will begin turning and activate the statues located in the Stoa of Athenians. The player must make their way over to get a better view of the statues as they spin in circles, and our job is to make sure that they stop by aiming one final spear throw, hitting the large gear in the back while the statues all turn and face slightly inward at the same time. This action will then lock the statues into place and force a light crystal to spawn out of the water and reflect the light beam to the next mirror plate. Now, up to this point, there has been a lot of setup going into the main quest. The opening of Pack-a-Punch, unlocking all four gauntlets, and getting your challenge rewards fully leveled up twice, so by the time the Easter egg starts, the player is pushing up against those more difficult rounds. That being said, the few steps we have completed thus far aren't exactly challenging by any means, as they are more fun to do in terms of logic puzzles. But this next chapter in our main quest journey is where the heat really begins to turn up. The player now needs to head over to the Offering of the Adelids and shoot vines that are sticking out of the wall with the redeemed hand of Gaia. Once this is complete, our large six-armed friend will jump out from behind the building in front of us, where we then need to lure him into the intersection of treasuries. Now, we must get the Giganese to activate his shield blast attack near this particular chaos crystal where a golden Ankh has been lodged inside. Once the Ankh has been broken free, we can kill the boss zombie and pick up a large golden pole. We're going to take this pole back over to the offering of the Adelids and insert it inside of the sundial contraption, where it will then begin 
one to activate. The sundial puzzle can be solved by killing an electric zombie on the dial so that it begins to spin. The outer edge of the dial will open up a small slot and display various Greek symbols. And when a blue symbol appears, we must remember its location as it passes underneath the lock spots of the dial and then line it up with the line of electricity. We rinse and repeat this process three times by killing more catalyst zombies on the sundial and lining up the subsequent inner rows until the puzzle is solved. But here is where the real challenge lies. The player needs to head over to the gymnasium bathhouse using the golden onk we picked up earlier, as well as the redeemed hand of Hamera wonder weapon, and place it on the statue of Raw Perk Machine so that it can penetrate a hole in the wall in front of it. And like I said before, this part is a bit tricky as it really is a defense holdout section. Zombies pour in from every direction, spar toy skeletons spawn in as well and use their shields to stop the hand of Hamera from breaking through the wall. And on top of all of that, a Blightfather joins the party, making everything super hectic in this tight enclosed space. I absolutely love it. Now there are methods to cheese it a little bit, whether it's using a spawn exploit or abusing the Pegasus strike with the raindrops, but I really don't recommend doing things like that because it takes away the fun of the challenge. Because there will be games where you complete this on your first try, but then there will be others where it will take you five or six tries and you'll want to throw your PC out the window. Once the wall has been broken through, we will then hear the Oracle cry out about how our enemy murdered her sisters as we can see their decapitated bodies chained to the back wall. And enough is enough, as our main characters are tired of the games the Oracle is playing and so they demand a name. The name of a madman who is torturing our newfound ally. And the name that we receive is Perseus, a demigod and the son of Zeus. This is where things take an interesting turn. Centuries ago, Perseus arrived in Delphi and demanded that the Pythia initiate the trial so that when he completed it, he would be worthy of then taking his father's throne. She declined his requests and said that it would be devastating. So he captured her sisters and held them as prisoners, severing off their body parts to show the Oracle that he meant business. And since her hand was now forced, she activated the trial, but with that came the destruction she forewarned. Despite the Pythia's help, months went by and Perseus was never able to complete the trial of Zeus, and as he continually failed, Delphi fell around him. Eventually, the Oracle tricked Perseus into entering a chamber that she said contained the key to victory. The Pythia said that Perseus had sacrificed enough, and he foolishly believed her. He was then swarmed with the undead and became what we see of him now as a zombie warlord trying to stop us at every turn. It appears that the Oracle didn't let the grudge of her sister's deaths go and was one step ahead of Perseus at his most dire hour. And even though the story ramps up quite a bit at this point in the quest, we still need to grab the staff on the table inside of the broken wall, place it on the raw statue's hand so that it can fire another beam into the bathtub in front of it, elevating another mirror plate to bounce the light beam into the next proper location. Now we can head over to complete what is probably one of the most infamous easter egg steps in Call of Duty Zombies history. Hit your marks. If the player makes their way over to the amphitheater area, there will be a spotlight shining down awaiting us to enter. After a few seconds of standing, the screen will flash white and the challenge will begin. The spotlight will begin to shine at various points inside of the amphitheater, indicating we need to kill zombies with either a standard shot or a charge shot and then run it back. But the real star of the show here is probably the song, as most fans find it to be quite fitting for not just ancient evil, but for this step in general, and I do tend to agree. The sequence will finally end with thunderous applause, some free points, and the light beam making its way to the dark side, waiting for us to cleanse the center. After the player teleports to the dark side, they must make their way to the back section of the map and enter in a code on the door of this locked chamber, perhaps the same chamber Perseus was locked in by the Pythia. I'm not 100% certain of that, but it is interesting to speculate. Once the code is entered and the player interacts with the doorway, a special cutscene for Bruno and Shaw will begin to play, but only if if you are those characters in game. This cutscene shows Bruno being taken over by the Order and becoming Dark Bruno, picking up a knife and stabbing Shaw to death. Dark Bruno then resurrects Shaw with the Staff of Raw, making Shaw now part of the Order. What is so wild about all of this is that this narrative thread was well established before the launch of Black Ops 4 Zombies inside of the comic book series. In the first comic book, Bruno is killed and Alistair revives him with the Staff of Raw, but it isn't until Voyage of Despair that we know Bruno has the darkness imbued with in him, and now, so does Shaw. Fortunately, we escape the chamber and can run over to a small marker on the ground where we can place down our Pegasus Strike. This will enable Pegasus to use his wings to create a strong gust of wind that picks up a large crossbow that we need to lock into place using the redeemed hand of Oranos. Once that happens, the player needs to teleport back to the light side, dip Apollo's will into the fire pit to turn your spear into the torch, then teleport back to the dark side, activate the venom trap, and then turn your spear into a venom torch. We then need to make our way back 
back up to the crossbow, melee the arrow with the venom flame so it can now launch across the map into the goddess, which moves her head so she stops dripping venom on the enclosure in the center of the world. Now that the venom is no longer dripping down, the light can penetrate through the shell, revealing the final teleporter for us to go and meet Perseus in one of the most epic locations we have ever had a boss fight, Mount Olympus. When our crew enters the boss arena, Perseus comes from behind, smacking us down, stating that we have served our purpose. This likely indicates that we have completed the trial for him, and now he can resume his plans of taking over his father's throne. He is also angry that Pegasus has been helping us throughout the main quest, and throws his sword at his steed, injecting him with chaos and making him obey him once again. This forces Pegasus to attack us since we are now useless pawns. This boss fight, while simple in principle, has a handful of moving parts that make it seem much more complicated than it really is. Pegasus flies around the map, sending down electric attacks that split up the small island the player is standing on into even smaller sections. This makes it hard to defend yourself against the zombies without taking damage. The player also has to be careful of Prima Materia that Perseus throws from atop Mount Olympus while simultaneously watching out for Blightfathers and Giganese as they can spawn in at any moment. The main goal is to shoot Pegasus while he is flying from island to island and knock him down, activating our specialist weapons to damage him. The catch is, after every cycle in the boss fight is completed, Perseus will destroy one of the two small islands, which not only limits our play space, but will forfeit the game if the player hasn't left the island in time. Absolutely brutal. Once Pegasus has been defeated, Perseus kills him and takes matters into his own hands by teleporting down from the mountain and using his special attack. The player has to be on defense for this attack as it can be nearly a one-shot if you're not careful. And after enough damage has been done to Perseus, just like with Pegasus, we need to activate our specialist and start swinging. Once this process has been done a couple of times, Perseus will cry out in defeat, dropping the key to free the oracle. Treyarch has always had a tough time dialing in their boss fights, as they need to be hard enough to be worth the player's time, easy enough for the masses, and as not to waste the player's time by going through an entire easter egg just to get slaughtered by a really unbalanced boss. But the battle between Pegasus and Perseus is a very strong showing of what Treyarch can do when they take the time to build an exceptionally fun experience across the spectrum of gameplay, level, and narrative design. There are just enough random elements to keep people on their toes, while also giving players the proper resources and context clues in order to survive. This was expertly crafted by Treyarch. Now that the boss fight is over, the cutscene begins to play. There are a lot of questions that need to be answered, but first things first, we need to free the Oracle, and as this is happening, she opens up a hidden chamber where Alistair is allegedly trapped. Scarlet stays with the Oracle to make sure that she is okay, while Bruno, Diego, and Shaw head down to retrieve Alistair. However, things take a turn when they witness that Alistair has been turned into stone, and suddenly, everything clicks for Diego, and he sprints back to Scarlet as he realizes the Oracle is really Medusa, but unfortunately, he is too late. Medusa has already revealed herself and has trapped Scarlet in an infectious kiss that has her revealing all the world's secrets of modernity. Diego arrives to witness the event, and Medusa tries to turn him into stone with her stare, but misses as he ducks behind a pillar. Medusa drops Scarlet on the ground and picks up the Order's mask to protect herself from the Prima Materia she summons, while saying that she is going to open the library and the world will be hers. Diego gathers Scarlet and brings her to safety, watching Medusa from afar as the screen fades to black. This map, quest, and ending were all so damn good. While we wrapped up a lot of loose ends from our first season of content, there are now even more questions to be answered, all from this one cutscene. Why exactly was Scarlet targeted by Medusa? Why did she kill Alistair? What is going to happen with Bruno and Shaw? Now, there are many inferences we can make based on the limited information that we have, such as the library is in reference to the Library of Alexandria, and other fans have theorized that Scarlet is actually a demigod in Medusa used her for her power. But these were all just theories to questions that, unfortunately, well, we'll get to all of that in just a bit. Despite the fact that there were so many major plot points resolved and cliffhangers established, I think it's completely undersold just how amazing of a job Treyarch did at connecting all of the narrative tissue inside of this zombie's experience. From the Chaos crew themselves, to the comics, to the Greek mythology, they completely knocked it out of the park. Each character in the Chaos crew had a substantial arc that they went through, or they became corrupted by Prima 
Materia, but the most interesting was Diego, who went from a complete playboy to taking a more serious hero's role by the end of this first season. We also had the amazing interweaving of Perseus, Pegasus, Medusa, and Zeus, taking this classical mythological tale and turning it on its head and putting a Call of Duty Zombies twist on it, and I think it was safe to say that the community was completely on board for the Chaos crew finally, and couldn't wait for more maps and narrative content to come down the pipeline. But unfortunately for Zombies fans, things were already rapidly changing behind the scenes as Activision had other plans to move Treyarch away from Black Ops 4 Zombies altogether. Inside of the 9 retrospective, we touched upon how the Black Ops 4 gameplay systems were really at their best inside of the Chaos maps, and Ancient Evil is really no exception. The choices Treyarch were making were all geared toward fulfilling that fantasy of redesigning history with a COD Zombies coat of paint. Things like the enemies being more aggressive balanced out the health and armor system when you have Elemental Zombies, Blight Fathers, Giganese, and the Zombie Spawn system, or having the Oracle Challenges which made for a variety of gameplay interactions while doing the Easter Egg each time as they pushed the player into high higher rounds and out of your comfort zone. Ancient Evil also has a strange layout that pushes players into corners or tight corridors, allowing us to activate our specialists to become unstuck. The map is also constructed in such a way that the atmosphere and level design work hand in hand with the gameplay. And all of these pieces in conjunction with the normal things that make zombies fun added to the feeling of in-game progression. And this worked really well inside of the Chaos maps when it was all packaged and presented in an atmospheric or narrative way. This is why the latter Ether maps in the DLC season didn't hit as hard because the way the gameplay mechanics were presented just didn't fit the same way that we had been used to for the prior decade. And a good example of this is the dynamic ally system that Treyarch built between the Oracle and the player. Inside of Ancient Evil, this idea is flushed out, whereas in maps like Alpha Omega or Tagged or Toten, working with Rushmore and Pablo is more so half-baked. And even though there is a lot to appreciate about those maps, it's clear that the fluidity of the system was fully realized on Ancient Evil. But how does it work? To get started, there is a tithing bowl where the player can place points points into in order to activate a challenge from the oracle in order to get a reward. The more challenges the player completes in succession, the greater the rarity the reward will be. And as we said in the previous section of the video, the player can receive a wide variety of items from weapons to extra lives. Now we know by completing these challenges up through the epic rarity twice will allow players to begin the easter egg, which is already amazing. But what really makes the ally system thrive is how interconnected it is to the narrative on top of the gameplay function. The oracle is constantly whispering sweet nothings into the player's ear convincing them that she is the damsel in distress and really needs their help to stop Perseus. She does this by telling you where dormant hand locations are hidden, where equipment and shield parts are located, she will even revive you, refill your ammo, or allow you to keep a perk after being downed. It's magnificent. And if you really want to get conspiratorial with me, this even pairs well with the Oracle's radios positioned around the map, as inside of these recordings she is speaking really negatively about the city of Delphi, Perseus, and her experience of being there. And I believe that this is more manipulation tactic that is designed to convince the player into siding with her by ignoring the nuance and making each scene black and white. And then, as we can see by the end of the map's easter egg, she indeed played us like a fiddle as she was the main villain all along. But there were these subtle clues throughout the map and the chaos story in general, like the Pack-a-Punch camo inside of Ancient Evil or the Medusa coins on 9. And this just makes the ally system even more genius, and I am in awe at how amazing of a job the developers did bringing all of these small details together, both narratively and systemically from a gameplay point of view. This is no easy feat. But that isn't where the magic stops, as Ancient Evil's wonder weapon selection and building process is some of the most streamlined and intuitive puzzle solving inside of all of Black Ops 4 Zombies. Overall, there are four different types of gauntlets that can be acquired, all with their own elemental capabilities and upgrading process. The player first has to start by finding the dormant hands hidden around the map in four locations. These spots can be a little tricky to find, but the main clue is that there will be a purple particle effect gently hovering atop the hidden hand. Then then all we need to do is shoot the spot to reveal the hand and go to the altar of our choice. The four elements here are Earth, Light, Death, and Wind, also known as the Hand of Gaia, Hemera, Charon, and Oranos. And all of these gods are correlated to the attack the hand can produce. Once we make our way to the altar, a corresponding color barrier will spawn, trapping the player inside, having to defend themselves from going down before the timer expires. And once complete, the base or fallen hand can be acquired, which has a basic projectile fire attack. So far, it's simple enough, but if we want to 
upgrade our weapons to the redeemed hand status, we need to push things a little further. Let's start with the hand of Gaia, the goddess of earth and the matriarch of all things in existence. After the fallen hand is picked up, the player needs to locate three bushes around the map with chaos crystals dangling from its leaves, shoot those crystals off where a small healthy seedling will sprout from the ground just in front of the bush. We need to pick that up and take it back to the shrine of Gaia three separate times. Once this is complete, a teleporter opens up and takes the player to a special location outside of the map, Earth's Rest, where they will have to kill zombies with the upgraded gauntlet. And the upgraded ability for this hand is pretty sick. The single shot fires a triple blast of rock debris at the zombies, but the charge shot pulls up chunks of the earth, killing everything in its path and then explodes, causing even more damage. What's really special about the charge shot is if you move your mouse or thumbstick quickly enough, you can control the curve or direction the debris will move, allowing the player to create some pretty cool defensive boundaries if they so desire. Upgrading to the redeemed hand of Himera is always interesting because this variant, while powerful, is always a bit strange to use as a primary mode of defending oneself, but we will get to that in a moment. Just like the hand of Gaia, once the fallen hand is ready, the player can acquire it and have the basic single fire mode of attack, but we will still need to solve a puzzle in order to elevate it to the next level. Around the map, there are three small mirrors that need to be shot with a bullet gun so that they are facing the correct way. From there, we want to shoot the mirror with the fallen hand of Himera so that it reflects the single light shot from the mirror to the light crystal and into a bull which harnesses the light. The player then needs to run up to that bull and melee it with the hand of Himera and run back to her altar and melee the light onto it. After this has been completed a few times, a portal will then open where we are able to practice using the redeemed version of this hand. This particular location, Light's Reflection, is one of the cooler places we get to travel for upgrading these hands as the player is on a giant mirror killing enemies with Himera's intense light beam charge shot. Himera is the goddess or representation of the day, which is why we are using light from above to slay our undead foe. It ends up not being the most useful of the four gauntlets, mainly in the higher rounds when the zombies become more aggressive, but it's still very cool and an interesting effect, especially since it's something we haven't really seen before inside of Treyarch Zombies. But now it's time to discuss the map's best wonder weapon variant, the Hand of Charon. Earlier in the video, we touched on Charon just a bit, but in short, Charon is the ferryman of the Greek underworld who carries souls across the rivers of Acheron and Styx, which separate the worlds of the living and the dead. But these souls will only be allowed to cross if they were lucky enough to have had funeral rites. And legend has it that Charon was an unpleasant creature and required people to pay him in obols in order to cross the river, and for those who didn't pay, they would wander the shores for many, many years. Treyarch created a wonderful puzzle for us to solve to upgrade this weapon using this Greek lore. Once the holdout challenge is complete, the player must go up to the River of Sorrow on the dark side of the map and kill zombies in the river, while the death animation sucks the zombies down to the depths of hell, turning the river red with the blood of our enemies. Now the player is to drink from the River of Sorrow, which will put them in a state of limbo where we are half dead and half alive. We cannot reheal our health, and if we go down, we are instantly dead and our game will end. But this state of in-between gives us a particular glimpse beyond the grave so we can see the obols hidden around the map that can be used to pay Charon and upgrade the hand. There will be many obols that lay around the map, but only three do we need to find, and the way that we can tell we have the correct ones is when the player hears this audio cue. From there, we must head back to the altar, hand over the obols, enter the teleporter, and travel to a secure location called Shadows Bank. As soon as the player lands, we can look to the waterfall and see Charon's boat gently gliding through the water ominously while zombies begin to spawn all around us. The view here is just spectacular as the deep, brooding reds paint a picture of just how bleak the underworld is and how lonely those wandering souls must fear after years of desolation. But we are here to upgrade our weapon, not to mingle with the afterlife, and seeing the redeemed hand of Charon in action is quite a sight. The charge shot is super powerful as it acts as a decoy where the zombie are all drawn to it and sucks a small group of zombies straight to hell. This is by far the best wonder weapon in the map and it's not even close. Lastly, we have the Hand of Oranos, and while it might not be the most OP gauntlet of them all, I saved it for last for a reason. And that is due to, again, the tying together of narrative strings that Treyarch does so well inside of this zombies experience. While the art direction, ally system, main quest, and wonder weapon upgrades all do exceptionally well at blending the core principles of game, level, and atmosphere design, this specific gauntlet does it better than the rest. You see, after you upgrade the dormant hand to the fallen hand of Oranos, the player needs to look around for large arrows that have been shot from Apollo on the dark side of the map. 
From there, we will need to hit a zombie with a single charge shot into these arrows, which will then knock out a single feather that we need to shoot back towards the shrine. The feather floats down gently and then turns into stone, melting into the shrine of the god of the skies. And just like the other redeemed hands, a teleporter opens up to a new location, Wind's Crest. Here the player learns about the ultimate ability for the hand, which is a gust of wind that will continuously blow until we let go of the trigger. And while this is a powerful ability, ammo can run dry quickly, making the redeemed Hand of Charon a much better alternative for a multitude of gameplay reasons, but particularly high rounds. Each one of these gauntlets was crafted with expert care as they all have their own special section to practice their redeemed versions. All are mesmerizingly beautiful with strong artistic direction and have distinct animations that make using them feel so damn powerful. Treyarch went above and beyond to make each gauntlet in this map exceptional with their own mythical godlike powers, and when combined with the fact that they utilize the level design perfectly to complement the gameplay, it truly is such a wonderful touch and adds even more value to the map as Ancient Evil is the quintessential BO4 Zombies darling. And you might think that we're done here, but Treyarch added an extra layer for those hardcore fans that want to push these gauntlets to their limits by creating exalted versions of all four hands. Once all of the gauntlets are in their redeemed state and the fire pit is lit inside of the Temple of Apollo, the player can light the tip of their spear and throw it over this column and bowl where it will then sit aflame. We can now go over to each of the gods' shrines, kill the corresponding catalyst on be next to it and then collect souls of the undead. Once all four shrines have been satiated, we can make our way to the Pack-a-Punch machine and accept specific challenges from each of the gods. The player will then be teleported to those previous locations we were before to upgrade the redeemed hands, but now there will be a twist. Perhaps there will be an onslaught of catalyst zombies, or maybe we will be overrun by mini-boss zombies. Either way, when the challenges are complete, we can finally Pack-a-Punch each of the gauntlets and get an additional bit of ammo added to our reserves. And while it isn't the most overpowered up, upgrade, it's certainly fun to do for those who are looking to squeeze a little more juice out of this brilliant map. It just seems like everything inside of Ancient Evil is thematically perfect, from Apollo's Will, which is an amazing shield full of style and masculinity, allowing players to defend, strike, and throw spears at their enemies, and the Pegasus Strike, hands down the coolest piece of equipment fans have ever received. Not only is it craftable, but it summons Pegasus to come and distract zombies away from you while casting down lightning from his wings. It is so damn epic, and it's the same with the traps as well. Bathhouses are known to be quite common in Greek culture, and inside of Ancient evil, we are able to turn one on to boil zombies alive while the water turns blood red. On the dark side, there is a trap that spews venom from the glands of a dead snake that's coiled up around the map. I mean, you just can't make this shit up. Ancient evil is oozing with creativity, so much so that it's literally spilling over into every single aspect of the mode, from gameplay to narrative and even into the enemy design. And while there are quite a lot of enemies inside of Ancient Evil, the utilization and balance of these enemy types is executed quite well. Treyarch doesn't overly spam the catalysts, which were very problematic inside of Voyage of Despair and 9, and there are new enemies introduced, like the Spartoi Warriors, who have a very stylistic stop-motion animation designed to them, as well as the Giganese, who have six arms with a sword, spear, and shield, along with a powerful attack that stunlocks the player for a few moments. When you also throw the Blightfather into the mix, it really does seem like a lot to put on the player. But to reiterate, the enemy balance is done really well, especially when you account for the Wonder Weapons, where things become even even more favorable for the player when you can send all of these bastards down to meet Hades himself. When it comes to side activities, modes, and easter eggs, this is really where the map falls short. And just like the rest of the maps in Black Ops 4, high rounds are largely the same experience. Although with the Giganese, it does make things a little exciting every now and again. But the usual strat of hanging out in the corner with a Hillian Salvo, PhD Slider, and the Wonder Weapon makes this high round just par for the course. Obviously, Rush isn't very exciting here either, and I would argue is one of the more tedious experiences to choose from, as this map doesn't really lend itself to great training spaces with tons of room, and the shield seems comparatively weak to others in BO4, it's just not a very fluid experience for that fast-paced, on-the-go gameplay. Ancient Evil's Gauntlet, on the other hand, is pretty enjoyable, but there is a step near the end that has you killing enemies just shy of round 30 with a non-pack-a-punched LMG. It's an absolutely tedious step, but the gauntlet is capped off by the Perseus boss fight, which does make things substantially more fun if you do make it that far. However, where Ancient Evil takes its biggest hit is with the number of side easter eggs that there are to complete, which 
which if you are not aware is virtually zero. Aside from upgrading the redeemed gauntlets to the exalted gauntlets, there isn't really anything to do. Sure, you can complete a couple challenges and get some free perks, maybe even a Pegasus Strike, but there really isn't anything other than those base gameplay mechanics to strive for. And the more that I have thought about this, the more strange I find it to be. How can a map that is as packed full of content as this not have anything extra to do? Dead of the Night does an excellent job of this with the steak knife and the Savage Impaler, and while I know that there are literally four wonder weapons with three levels to upgrade and a Pegasus Strike to craft, you would think that there would maybe be something else to strive for. A free perk? An extra slot for the Pegasus Strike? A secret upgrade for Apollo's Will? But no, there's just nothing. I think either way you slice it, Ancient Evil stands on its own two feet despite having none of this extra content, which is a testament to how well the developers did at making this map feel special. Not only does every progression path you take as a player feel fully rewarding, but the way you interact with the map makes you feel like you're bending the world around you with your will to satisfy your needs as a player. And that is just really damn special. The phrase development hell can't fully encapsulate what Treyarch went through when building Black Ops 4. Not only did everything go wrong that the devs could anticipate, but so did everything that they couldn't. A catastrophic storm of leaks, budgeting problems, and technical issues all but capsized the studio. Which is why when you zoom out and look at Ancient Evil on an individual level, it's quite miraculous that it ever even came into existence. And yet, despite the choir of fans wailing dastardly over the chaos storyline and the rejection of BO4's new Zombies gameplay mechanics, Ancient Evil broke free from the clench of the community, slipping perfectly into what could be called the perfect representation of Black Ops 4 Zombies. The Chaos storyline ended on an amazing cliffhanger. The map was breathtakingly gorgeous, the wonder weapons were fun to build and use, the quest was intuitive yet challenging, and the boss fight was epic and satisfying for veterans and new players alike. It truly was a masterpiece. But due to the nature of AAA game development, it didn't matter and this map's success meant nothing in the grand scheme of things, as the perfect storm, which clouded Black Ops 4 Zombies, continued to brew, causing Activision to to do what they do best. The Chaos storyline had now been cancelled, which meant that the seasonal DLC model we were expecting was also gutted. Treyarch also received substantially less funding as compared to when they started the zombie season and were working with only a handful of developers at the end of the game's life cycle. But what really sealed the deal for Zombies fans' fate was the collapsing of Sledgehammer Games and Raven's Call of Duty title that was slated for 2020. And due to the disgruntled nature of the employees working at those companies, Activision pushed Treyarch in the middle to clean up the mess which was the perfect perfect and final excuse needed to end the BO4 Zombies experiment. I know it's cliche, but now that we can all look back at these Call of Duty projects and evaluate them based on our current circumstances, the cancellation of the Chaos storyline after Ancient Evil is the only instance that makes me utter the phrase, what if? What if we were able to see the Library of Alexandria come to fruition? Would that have led to a Medusa boss fight? What happened to Bruno and Shaw after secretly being part of the Order? Where was our crew supposed to go after exploring Delphi? There are so many unanswered questions that bubble up to the surface as the chaos story was beginning to get really exciting. The maps and art design, the potential main quests, and the gameplay additions that could have taken place over the coming year, it feels like we got completely robbed. Not to mention the potential for Zombies Chronicles 2 and the slew of other content that has been leaked from other creators. Black Ops 4 Zombies had the potential to be one of the greatest Call of Duties of all time, and it's a reality that we will never get to know or even fully understand. And we could sit here and point fingers at the developers for making too many gameplay changes at launch, or we could blame the community for being too harsh with their criticisms of the game, or we could blame Activision for pulling Treyarch off to develop Cold War Zombies. But to tell you the truth, figuring who is at fault is simply a waste of time, because what's done is done, and there is now a void in our zombies corner of the world without all of this amazing content that could have come to life if the circumstances of Black Ops 4's development weren't so goddamn perfectly flawed. Now earlier in this video, I discussed how Blundell didn't want his team to make any decisions hastily about the mode until things had calmed down in the community. But Blundell's fear came to life anyway, and it came with a new Zombies worldview. A worldview where the art direction, narrative, and quests take a backseat to more simple systemic gameplay designed to appease an ever-expanding pool of casual players. And it's not a bad thing, it's just different. And more importantly, it's the truth. I think it's pretty obvious that many Zombies fans can look back at Black Ops 4 Zombies with confidence and think about how much better things could have been if certain gameplay mechanics would have been designed or organized 
eyes differently. But what I don't think fans ever anticipated was losing the magical narrative and atmospheric elements that had been the lifeblood of the mode for years. Despite making a bad map every now and again, Treyarch in 2018 clearly knew what Zombies was supposed to be, and now with major shifts in direction, I'm not as confident the newer Treyarch developers hold the same core beliefs. And even though Modern Zombies isn't bad, it's scary to witness the one thing that we all loved change in a manner which longtime fans could have never anticipated. This is why Ancient Evil is a true representation of looking back in the mirror of what once was. A map full of style, beauty, and mystery. A map with a wonderful main quest and great use of the gameplay systems that Black Ops 4 had to offer. A map with a narrative that was so cinematic and intriguing that it felt like you were playing inside of a movie. Now I won't sit here and say that we will never see a map the likes of Ancient Evil ever again, but I can say for certain that if we do, it's probably not coming for a very long time. This idea has led fans to realize what has been lost from zombies and what makes the mode truly special, marking Ancient Evil as a pinnacle moment of regret inside of the zombies community. I'm, I'm really excited about this map. Uh, we've previously said that the, the remaining maps on this season will return to the Ether story. So I think this is a, a really special place yes. to leave the Chaos crew. Um, and I think people are going to have fun with it.